Welcome to the meeting for the Hempfield Area School Board uh, for today. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which it stands, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is Pam on virtually? She is. <laughs> Can you do roll call, Pam? Sure thing. Michael Ferry? Here. Sonia Brodrick? Here. Jennifer Bretz? Here. Diane Sibitoni? Here. Vince D'Augustine? Here. Jeannie Smith? Here. Paul Ward? Here. Scott Learn? Here. Tony Bompiani? Here. Okay, and we also have Gianna online. Okay. Hello, Gianna. Um, I just want to uh, announce that we went into executive session on Monday, January 18th to discuss legal and personnel issues. We began at 8.15 and ended at 10 o'clock p.m. And then this evening, we began at 5.30 and ended at 7 p.m. in another executive session to again discuss legal and personnel issues. We'll move on to mission statement. Gianna, would you take that for me? Yep. The Hempfield Area School District and its commitment to excellence shall engage and educate all students for personal success through a shared responsibility with the student family and community in a safe, secure, and nurturing environment. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to superintendent's report. Dr. Wilicki. Thank you, Dr. Bompiani. On November 2nd, we had as a part of the superintendent's report presentations by our elementary, middle, and high school principals where they were sharing their year-long goals. This evening, after three months, we have asked the middle and high school principals to join us this evening. Elementary will be joining us uh, at, during the February 15th meeting, and they're going to be sharing the progress that has been made towards those goals. They'll be sharing baseline data, um, in other terms, their starting point, and the data that identifies the progress that has been made to date. The presentations are going to identify some areas where we feel some added efforts are necessary and on January the 15th, just a few weeks ago, the Hempfield Area School District received notice that we are going to receive $2.6 million, $2,627,714 to be exact, as a part of the ESSER, E-S-S-E-R, which is the acronym for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. These funds can be utilized for one of three purposes. The first is addressing learning loss among students. And that's the part that you're going to hear our principals allude to this evening in regards to the plans to address some of the needs that are identified in their presentations. The second and third purposes for which the funds can be used are making school facility repairs to reduce the risk of virus transmission. And the third is to improve indoor air quality in school facilities, including mechanical um, HVAC areas. There may be some needs in that regard. However, we do view um, the needs being very high in regards to addressing learning loss, as you're going to hear through our principal's reports this evening. So we're going to start with the high school. We have Mrs. Charlton, our high school principal, assistant principals, Mrs. Mash and Mr. Saracini, who are joining for the presentation. They're going to share several slides, which I will present, and certainly we will be able to take any questions at the conclusion of their presentation. Dr. Connor, anything you wanted to add? Just a, a few words. Um, first and foremost, thank you, Dr. Balicki. I just want to tip my hat to all the building principals, assistant principals, et cetera. Uh, when you think about this school year, it is not normal. Um, and they have definitely um, been working very diligently, thinking outside the box. And I just want to applaud their efforts, uh, them and also their, their building staff. Um, because as, as you'll see, it's been very difficult trying to meet students' needs, and um, I must say that I am thoroughly impressed by their dedication, and I know that they will continue to work towards these goals. Thank you. And with that, we will turn it over to, and I'm not sure, Mrs. Charlton, if you are beginning, or Mr. Saracini or Mrs. Mash. Mr. Saracini is going to present tons of data for you tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Charlton. Thank you, Dr. Walecki. Um, thank, thank you, uh, Board of Directors. We appreciate the opportunity to come in this evening and discuss our midpoint progress with you. 
Um, it, like Dr. Connor said, it, it's been an interesting year. It's one full of challenges. Um, however, our students have risen to the risen to the task. They are working very hard. They're diligent in their studies, and it's our job to support them in whatever way we can to ensure that they are successful moving forward. So tonight, what we'd like to do is just review our three goals with you, present our baseline data, where we stand right now, and what our plan looks like moving forward. So Dr. Walicki, if you could go to the first slide, please. Um, now, with our first goal, this addressed attendance, behavior, and course grades. And if you notice, the very first part of this goal, we had to alter a little bit. Initially, our goal indicated that we were going to look at students who are considered um, habitually truant which really is six or more unexcused absences. However, with the, with the move from asynchronous to synchronous, virtual to hybrid, back to virtual, um, we, we felt like we weren't capturing enough of our students because that population was very, very small. So we adjusted this goal slightly to look at students who are just habitually absent, regardless of whether these are excused or unexcused absences, because we need to ensure that we capture all students not just those that were unable to turn in excuses in a timely fashion. Um, the next portion obviously is dealing with reducing our behavior incidents. So we are looking at out of school and in school suspensions and looking to reduce that by 5%. And then our course, uh, course grades goal was to look at, the, look at reducing the number of students who are failing courses by 5% um, by creating a data-driven instruction plan that really improves both cohort and yearly graduation rates. So Dr. Walicki, if you could go to the next slide and click the link for me, please. Um, what I'd like to do is just kind of address some of, some of where we started and where we are now. So I wanna go a little out of order. I'd like to really start with behavior. Um, so at this point in the 2019-2020 school year, um, we had 82 students experience some sort of in-school suspension and 36 students experienced some sort of out of school suspension. At approximately the same time during the 2020-2021 school year, you notice that number for in school suspensions is down to seven and out of school suspensions down to eight. Now, the midpoint data shows us that that's a 91% reduction in in school suspension and a 78% reduction in out of school suspension. And as much as I think our administrative team would love to sit here and take credit for all of that, we can't. Um, they, uh, we kind of have a feeling that the pandemic has a lot to do with it. A and really, when you look at students in an all virtual environment, they're not going to be ex experiencing behaviors that could possibly affect any type of consequence here in school. So when we bounce from hybrid into virtual and then back to hybrid, we're seeing portions of our population day in and day out. And overall, our students at the high school are great. They, they are fantastic kids, they work hard, they're dedicated, and they behave. Um, now, like all human beings, mistakes are made, and sometimes those mistakes and, and come with consequences, and that's where you see these numbers. However, our students learn from that, and they grow from that, and, and they get better and better and better every single time we have a conversation with them, and, and they want to do well, and they want to succeed. So as, as we look forward and we continue to do that, this aspect of improving behavior really comes down to establishing positive professional relationships with our students. And the more that we can do that as an administrative team, as a teaching staff, and as an overall building, we, we will continue to see lesser and lesser behaviors that result in any type of suspension. So our focus moving forward is really looking at developing those positive professional relationships with all of our kids. Now, the second portion of this, if you could scroll down just slightly, Dr. Walicki, would be looking at the attendance piece. Um, now, we wanted to start this way back in November. However, when we looked at it and we started to pull the data we needed, we weren't pulling the right data. Like I mentioned, we had to kind of revise this goal because we weren't capturing the students we needed to capture in our report. So we started again on uh, January 19th, and we, are, we have been looking at students, and right now we're not at the point where we have any. We are looking at students who have six or more absences, regardless of excused or unexcused as our baseline. At that point, what we are looking to do is really get in and start putting those interventions in place because we all know the more you're in school, the better you do. So we're looking at school attendance improvement conferences. 
which are the SAIC meetings, where this is where you sit down with students and the family and you put together a team. Uh, Mrs. Darcy Markovic is on that team, our home and school visitor, the principal, oftentimes the counselor. And we start to put a plan together on what it is we can do to best support students' attendance, both in person and virtually. Um, and, and that can kind of go in many different directions based upon what, what is going on in the home. Um, so we're looking to do that. We're going to rely on uh, Mrs. Dar Darcy Markovic again to run those biweekly attendance uh, reports so that we can then cross-reference it with our list of students and, and hopefully see a, a decrease in students that miss uh, school, whether on their hybrid virtual days or brick and mortar. Um, now, like I said, we all know that students who attend school more frequently do better academically. So when we look at the course grades portion of this piece, if you take a look at the baseline data, which we pulled on December 14th, we had 193 ninth graders failing one or more courses. As of 126, 2021, that number has decreased to 131. In the same time frame, we had 167 10th graders failing one or more courses, and now that's down to 84. We had 173 11th graders, now down to 109. And we had 188 uh, 12th graders, which is now down to 83. So this really equates to roughly a 32% reduction in ninth grade, nearly a 50% reduction in 10th, nearly a 37% reduction in 11th, and nearly a 56% redu uh, reduction in 12th grade. So, so we're definitely on the right track. However, we still have too many students not being successful in school. Um, and what we did to see some of these drops is we, uh, we are working hard with our teachers um, and, and we pushed out to them something known as Pathways to Virtual Intervention. And our teachers embraced this and, and they really ran with it. They made it their own um, because they are doing everything in their power and bending over backwards to help each one of our kids uh, throughout this entire process. So what the Pathways to Virtual Intervention does is it really develops a plan that outlines step by step what everybody on the team needs to do moving forward when we start to see a student's grade slip. So that includes making contact with the student, the parent, by email, by phone, scheduling uh, Google Meets in order to really see them face to face, developing individualized plans, helping students get caught up on makeup work by establishing a framework looking to see if there are outside influences that are negatively impacting student grades, attendance, and behavior, um, and, and really trying to get a picture of the whole child. And the more that we can do that, the better off we're going to do um, in, in supporting our kids. So this to us is a very huge piece. So on top of it, kind of bringing this back a little bit, we also set up two different mentoring systems to continue to in an attempt to build those positive professional relationships. And the first one we set up was really looking to utilize our homeroom activity period, where our homeroom teachers are working with the roster with their roster of homeroom students, and they're setting up a meeting plan where they are checking on the students' attendance, their behavior, and their grades. And if they see anything um, concerning or or actually not, I'll say not on par. What they're going to do is work with that student to develop a plan on how do you get caught up, what to do um, when you fall behind, how do you get to school more often. Um, set a plan for a normal routine. If it's your virtual day and you're used to not going to school and you don't get up until 11 or 12 o'clock, you know, set that plan to get up at 7. Do your routine. Go get your shower. Have your breakfast. So it's trying to establish normalcy in a very, you know, I'll say chaotic world that we live in. So our homeroom teachers are working through that. The second portion of our mentoring system um, is actually run by Mrs. Katie Kurtzoy and um, our United Spartans group, where we have junior and senior students pushing into uh, freshman homerooms and acting as mentors um, to kind of guide freshmen to help ease some of the stress that comes with the transition to high school, um, the anxiety that comes with, you know, going from, I'll say smaller buildings into a large building, going from, you know, not a lot of classes to a lot of classes, being a big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a big pond. So we're looking to, we're looking to utilize our students who have experienced all of this and, and use their expertise as well to assist our current students um, in, in their transitions. Now, this kind of leads through, if you could scroll down a little bit more, Dr. Walicki, 
this kind of leads into this next piece because I, we wanted you to see how these grades actually broke down. Um, and, and I will say, at least when I was looking at this data personally, I, I was somewhat shocked by what I saw. Um, the majority of our students who are failing classes right now actually come to school on a hybrid model. They are here at least every other day. That's under the assumption they attend on their in-person days. Um, so in ninth grade, we have 86 out of those, uh, well, what was that number? 86 out of the 131 that are failing one or more classes. They're actually hybrid students. Um, so we have some opportunities in the day that we could utilize to really start helping these kids. Um, if you wouldn't mind scrolling down, Dr. Wilicki, we will uh, go and do 10th grade as well. In 10th grade, you'll see the same pattern. The majority of our kids that are not successful right now academically are on the AB model. So in 10th grade, what we're looking at is 56 out of those, uh, what was that, 80, 84 students, they're on, the a, they're on an AB model as well. So again, opportunity is in the day for us to do something. Um, if you look at the 11th grade, you'll see the same pattern. 67 out of the 109 are on the AB model. And with 12th grade, it's the exact same thing. It's 52 out of the 83 or AB. So we have time in our school day that we can utilize to better reach these students. And this is where we kind of need a little bit, uh, I'll say a little bit of assistance. And this is where we'll tie this together at the end, where we would like to see some of this grant money directed. We, we want to build some programs into our day to better assist these students. Um, but before we do that, um, Dr. Wilicki, if you could go back to the presentation. Um, we'd like to talk about the rest of our goals. So goal two deals with increasing that, uh, in, increasing student achievement on the Keystone exams. Now, obviously we did not have Keystone exams in May because of the pandemic and the waiver. But what we are doing right now is we are establishing that data, database system of benchmark testing using CDTs and MyPath data to try and ensure our students are on the proper pathway. So when it comes time for testing in May, we have an accurate representation of where our students will perform. So if Dr. Wilicki, if you could go to the next slide and click the ELA CDT data link. So what we're looking at first it is really just, I'll say a breakdown of the first and second CDT tests um, for 10th grade. And initially up in the top left corner, um, right beside the histogram of the first CDT test, you'll see the PVOS probability of proficiency. So that's the Pennsylvania value added assessment system. And that's what they are saying, Hemfield area high school for our cohort, we should have 73.53% of our students scoring proficient on the Keystone exam. So it's an achievable number. Um, so when we kind of set this up, we decided the CDT, though it's not a predictor, it does address the standards, so let's use the CDT. So the first test that we have, which would be the left graph, um, we had 293 test takers on that first exam, and that's out of approximately 430 sophomores. So we definitely did not capture the entire sophomore class in this data, which is concerning. However, at the same time, we did have some issues that we, that we do know are prevalent, and that we're working to address. And some of that is connection issues outside of school from, from home. There were different links that had to be used that we did not have set up. Um, but even when they were set up, we had, didn't have success. So it delayed progress that way. Um, but we're still working to address those. So of those 293 test takers for this first CDT, we had 163 of them score proficient, um, which is approximately 56% of our student body um, way back in late September, early October, score proficient on the test. So as, as a starting point, not having any in-person instruction since March, it's a workable number. And we can see that number as something that we can grow. So after some instruction, and we gave the second CDT test, if you notice the total number of test takers dropped. It dropped to 276. And also the number of students that scored proficient dropped to 142. So that right there tells us, number one, we had a decrease 
overall in proficiency. We had a decrease overall in the number of students that were proficient um, as well. So looking at this, we have some work to do. And what we did between test one and test two is kind of really setting the stage for everything we're gonna do in the future. So Dr. Wilicki, if you could click the very last tab across the bottom, ELA areas of concern. Thank you. Now on this, uh, the English department worked very, very hard to identify the standards in which our students were not meeting proficiency. And if you notice the column on the very far right that's, that appears to be highlighted all in yellow, because it is highlighted all in yellow, those are the standards that our students were not on grade level for. So that, those are the most concerning standards that we have because we need to close those gaps before we can expect proficiency on the standards in which are on grade level. So what we did was we worked to identify these and in the number of occurrences column, that's how many students missed the question regarding that standard. Um, and like I said, anything below grade level is not acceptable. So we had to get that caught up. So our English teachers, they worked together, they paired up, they analyzed the data individually for each teacher's classroom rosters. And then they developed plans that they started to implement on how are they going to address these standards? Where are they looking to close these gaps? Um, and that's been ongoing since December. Now we're getting ready to do the exact same thing for the second CDT test. The administration of that just ended last week, so we have not gotten to that point yet. Um, but what we want to see is number one: have we closed the gaps on, on not on these not on grade level standards? And if we have, where where did the new deficiencies come from? And if we haven't closed the gaps, what do we need to do instructionally to better support our students? So what we're going to do moving forward is we're going to do the exact same process. We're going to look at the CDTs. We're going to break it down by standard. We're going to identify the ones where our students are uh, needing the most assistance. And then we're going to put plans in place to ensure that we can support them through classroom instruction in order to get them back to, back to grade level and back on track. Um, now, Mrs. Charlton's going to talk a little bit about the MyPath data um, because she is so knowledgeable about that piece of it. My path is a, is a very different test from the CDTs. The CDTs more or less look at the deficits and the transmissions of the curriculum standards. CDTs, or my path, is based on the highly sequential nature of math, and it assesses the needs of the individual through an initial assessment, and it determines an individualized learning path for each student. And those learning paths are more based um, rather than on standards across the board, they're based on standards that you would find at various grade levels. So if you take a look at the chart that's right now, the chart on the top shows us how many Mrs. students- Mrs. Charlton, <laughs> Mrs. Charlton, can I interrupt you yeah. for one second? You're coming a little garbled in here. Rob, is there anything oh. we can do for that? Yes, sir, come I'll come closer. closer. Okay. That may help. It yeah, just that... sounds like it's getting louder and then weaker. So maybe just closer and staying at that location may help. Okay. So if there's anything you'd like me to re redo, I will I will bore you with what I've already said. But if you look at the chart, it's based on how many students that that test initially who scored at a at a grade level, a certain grade level. Mrs. Um, Charlton, I'm going to interrupt. I apologize. It's really difficult for us to hear. I wonder if it's your home mic and maybe um, oh, Mrs. Masher, Mr. Mr. Sarah Sadie could do it. I'm at school. I couldn't run talk to the library. Now, I'll, I'll try going over to Greg or Anita's hot office. Okay. Okay. I'll we'll just take a quick pause. She she, well, it, it, if I may, Dr. They're, Malicki, they're, while Mrs. Charlton is walking over, going to his um, office. I, I would yeah, also like to office. add one portion to to the CDT data for ELA that I think is actually important for everybody to understand. And, and that piece of it is the fact that the research has shown basically time in and time out that CDT scores do drop from test one administration to test two administration because what they're looking to do is assess every standard the student should master by the end of that 10th grade year. Teachers might not have gotten to the point of being able to teach all of those and assess all of those to ensure that students are on the right path. But we don't want to use that number one as a reliable measure or number two as an excuse. We need to make sure that what we do benefits our students day in and day out. 
So even though that research does show that, we still need to make sure that our students are getting the best preparation possible to be successful. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Mrs. Charlton because I just got the thumbs up. She's good. Okay, I'm back. Um, so if you take a look at the charts for the CDTs, you will see where our students tested in. And the only year that we have been able to do the complete year is starting in the year of 2018 and September and finishing in May of 2019. So you can get a little bit of a perspective as to how well the students did. And they, and they really did a great job. Um, one of the things that the, the CDTs develop an individualized learning path for each student. And that learning path includes um, intervention uh, for instruction. Can you? It includes um, remediation and it includes practice for each of the students. We are using the CDTs in the math lab that we added. And in the math lab, that enables the teachers to determine which students need extra help. Those, the, the, the data that we receive from the CDTs also enables the, the teachers to group students with similar learning targets. So it makes instruction on the part of the teacher much more efficient as the students are working on my path. We were really pleased because in the first year, we saw an increase from 26.8% of our first year test takers in math increased to 43.3% proficient and advanced. So we were very pleased with the outcome of the CDTs. The teachers in the math department and everyone who are using, I'm sorry, not the CDTs, but the my path, are very happy with it. And they have developed a, an outstanding process for using this to benefit our students. One thing that we're concerned about is if you look at the chart, you will see that our, our, I, our learning support students are not doing well as far as incoming placement in my path, and they are pretty deficient in skills. So as a result, and we're not going into that tonight, but we do have some plans to revise the special ed curriculum and to revise the way we're using our special ed teachers in math instruction and in instruction of all the other four areas. So that's something that we will be looking forward to and implementing um, for next year. So I will turn it over to Mr. Sarsini, and I hope you were able to hear me. Much better. Good. Thank you, Mrs. Carlton. Um, so, so to kind of finish out this second call, I, I apologize, I'm echoing. Hold on one second. Okay, that, that should be better. Um, so to finish out the second goal, what we're looking to do is then do a complete Keystone data analysis of our first time test takers um, once we test in May. And we're gonna take a look to see whether or not our ELA CDT data and our math uh, iPath data leads us down the, down the right pathway to ensure that we have an accurate, uh, uh, I'll say an accurate prediction of where we're going to score on the Keystone um, for algebra and literature, and then do a comparison to ensure that our instructional practices are aligned to that, to make sure that not only are we teaching what we should be teaching, but we're also getting our students to the standards in which they need to master. So moving into goal three, which is our final update for the evening, is to influence the mindset and culture of the high school community so that all students will have access and equitable opportunities. And we wanted to do that by revising some course offers, offerings, doing an equity audit, um, new scheduling procedures and practices. So we, we've been plugging away on this one as well. And, and Dr. Alecki, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so obviously, the board is aware of our TSI designation. So we, are, we met as a TSI team in September, October, and November, started to develop our TSI plan, which really focused on the needs that were identified um, through that process, which really dealt with graduation rate and uh, some deficiencies in our special ed programming. But we wanted to expand that. We, we wanted to ensure that all of our students have equitable 
uh, equitable opportunities. And, and really what it comes down to, again, is it goes back to building those professional, positive relationships with our students, making sure that they know that they are here and we want them to be here, that we treat them not as just a student, but as an individual. Um, and, and it's more than just academics. It's social and emotional needs. So this whole audit revealed not only do we have some areas we need to wake, uh, work on academically, we need to make sure that we're supporting the whole student moving forward. So in our uh, December faculty meetings, we really focused on building those positive professional relationships with students. And we talked about those mentoring plans in detail with our staff and laid it out and, and worked with them to ensure that they understood the expectations. And they, they provided more, more positive suggestions on what we could do within the classrooms um, than I think any one of us could have come up on our own. So our teachers are phenomenal at, at putting their heads together and developing these plans to support our students. So along these lines, we also wanted to take a look at our program of studies and our scheduling process because we wanted all students to have equitable opportunity to courses um, to meet their pathways for the way they see their futures going. So we, our January faculty meeting was working with our faculty to review the program of studies, looking at areas that we could really set, uh, I'll say set ourselves apart to ensure that all of our students had those opportunities. After that, we started to focus on one-on-one -on -one meetings with our department chairs to really discuss how can we begin to make our courses more inclusive rather than uh, more exclusive. And they, again, had some wonderful ideas and we're looking to implement some of those this uh, for this upcoming year. And then moving forward, we wanna start conducting uh, some more professional development and really focus on ideas uh, along the lines of growth mindset and building equitable classrooms within the school district. And we're looking to set up a Google Classroom and do it more so as an article study uh, because of the limited time um, that we have with our faculties this year. Uh, we, we feel that this way we can at least continue to engage them in professional learning while still also allowing them the time that they need to ensure that their instructional practices are, are on par. So all of this ties together into really what we need moving forward. So our interventions right now really need to focus on, on our students and they need to focus on providing them the supports that are necessary. And we wanna target our ninth and 12th graders to start because at least for ninth grade, and we feel this is really because of the pandemic, we didn't have an opportunity to properly transition them into the building. Um, they, they're coming from middle schools where they're dealing with probably anywhere from four to six Man, four or five teachers at any given time um, to the high school where they can have seven or eight teachers in a day. Uh, so the transition to more teachers, more classrooms, a bigger building, we, we just don't feel we were able to make that personalized connection with the kids this year. And we think that's a big reason why we, we're seeing the failure rates we're seeing in ninth grade. So we want to really try and help these kids out and provide additional support. So we would like to use some of the grant money to get certified teachers, one in English, one in math, one in science, and one in social studies for the remainder of the year to be able to come in and work with students throughout the school day as we identified most of our students are here on an A-B schedule, work with them throughout the school day in order to use the content that they're learning in their classrooms to really help drive the skills that they might be uh, lacking at this point so that we can build a I'll say build a skill set that's transferable across all disciplines moving forward. So what we want to do is work with those students um, during different points throughout the day and, and provide those supports as we progress through. And we think that will continue to help decrease some of the failure rates that we're seeing. Now, this ties directly into the 12th grade uh, plan as well. So Dr. Willicki, if you could go to the next slide and then Mrs. Mash is going to jump in. Um, and take this because she has been an integral part of working with the counselors uh, to develop this plan and it, it's it's good one. Hello, uh, the rationale for the senior plan is simple, graduation. As stated before, our data shows that 83 seniors were failing at least one course, but with the seniors you have to dig a bit deeper. With the schedule opening up to 10 periods a few years ago, many of them are in good shape credit wise. So the 83 has actually become 55 students that need, we needed to take a closer look at. All of them have been in meetings with school counselors 
to determine a course of action that will turn things around and put them back on track for graduation. Only 16 of the 55 had to add a semester course to their schedule to reach the required number of credits to graduate. A few were able to fit the classes into their schedules, but those that could not were scheduled for a credit recovery course through Ingenuity. But as we know, some seniors were in this predicament because they didn't do well with remote learning or they simply weren't logging on on a regular basis. The staff that we would use to help build school, the skills with the freshmen would also serve a dual role to oversee students in the Ingenuity Credit Recovery Court. They would monitor these students, assist with the content as needed, and provide checkpoints along the way to keep the students working at a steady pace that will get them successfully to the finish line. The remaining 39 seniors are what I call on a watch list, meaning that they are in year-long courses and their grade at the halfway point requires continuous monitoring and checking in, which will be a collaborative effort among their teachers, the school counselors, and myself. These students will also be scheduled with the anticipated additional staff to fill in any gaps. And that's our plan for consideration to support the seniors. I'd like to thank the high school principals for sharing. This is really the heart of our work when we talk about student achievement and we talk about intervening in an appropriate time to change course. So the data that was shared this evening, I, I know took a lot of time to pull together. I think it was very telling in regards to where we are currently and where we need to go. At this time, I'd like to open it up for questions from our board members. So I, I would like to thank you all as well for the hard work you're putting in and our staff, the teachers and everybody up to this point. I mean, the, the job has been monumental. We knew starting something new like this across the country, we knew the children are really suffering through this and it's so nice to see that we are taking a proactive um, step to try and find out some of our deficiencies, where they are and how we can correct them. So really thank you for such a great report. Um, any board questions? Anybody in the room? Online, any board questions? I have a question. Um, you said that some of the kids um, did not take the keystone test, the science and the math keystone due to COVID. Will they make those tests up? Great question, Mrs. Brooks. Great question. Um, basically, what has happened, and hold on here, I, I have the letter right here. PDE is actually allowing students who received a passing grade in the corresponding Keystone course, so that would be our Algebra 1, our Biology, or our 10th grade English classes um, during the 2019-2020 school year to uh, be awarded a non-numerical proficiency score. Um, so they do not have to test. Um, so any student who was not successful in those courses obviously are back in those courses again this school year. And we are anticipating testing um, in May and we'll be testing Algebra 1, Biology and Literature at that point as well um, to all students currently enrolled in a Keystone Trigger course. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any other thank questions you. online? Okay. I, I had a question, and, and I might have missed you talking about this, but you said you wanted to use some of the grant money um, to help remediate the students, the ones who are coming to school, and you'd be able to do that. Do you, do you have any plans to help the students who are on full-time virtual or in the um, other, um, other than the program to help them? Jeannie, we have encouraged our teachers to engage with their kids, um, if you can hear me, I'm sorry, more fully. Um, we, when the teachers, we are having the teachers work with those kids who are out of school during their prep periods, during activity periods, um, during any period of the day to try them more fully drawn into what we're doing here. There, is, there are also some those kids that I would like to pull back in, especially at the ninth grade and some of those seniors, because some kids just haven't been successful with um, learning online. But surprisingly, I, th I think Greg said this, surprisingly, the kids who are not doing as well are the kids 
actually who are here every other day, they're doing less work than the kids who are out all of the time. So, you know, it's a balancing act and we're trying a variety of ways to work with those kids and get them back involved. Okay. Any other questions from board members? You know, I, I, I had just a couple clarification for Mr. Saracini. Um, you had our failing uh, rates in all four classes, all four grades, going down substantially. Did you compare them for the same classes or same grades, or did they, did they go up? Did you compare last year's 12th grade with this year's 12th grade, or did you compare last year's 11th grade with this year's 12th grade? So, Dr. Bombiani, if we're looking at the vertical charts from 2020 to 2021, those are just representative of the current grade levels. Um, if we if we scroll down um, to the horizontal charts below the vertical charts, right. that give us a snapshot of uh, where we were last year at this time to where we are this year at this time. The comparison has to go from ninth grade in 2019-2020 to 10th grade in the 2020-2021 school year. We need to compare the same cohort um, as we move forward. So if we look at that, um, last year at this point, we had 28, uh, 28 students from the class of 2023 failing one or more classes. This year, we have 38 students failing one or more classes from the class of 2023. So we saw 10 students, uh, 10 students who were not failing a class as of this time last year, now failing a class as of this time this year. So the comparison is actually um, by, by cohort for graduation year, um, which is why the 12th grade in 1920 is left blank because there is no comparison. They've graduated. So seeing the data from them last year really does not give us any, any forward moving point because that cohort is no longer with us. Okay. Does that does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, it, it does. And then the, it, it goes right into another question with the proficiency. Um, did you compare it to last year or did you just have the proficiency for this year? Because we're, and, we're, our proficiency isn't as good this year, but I, I didn't know what it was like last year for those grades. In, in compare, like in, re, in reference to the CDTs? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, no, I have not compared that um, between last year and this year at this point. That is actually data I'm currently pulling. Okay. Um, so I, I will have those numbers shortly. I just don't have them tonight. Okay. Well, I think the... I think the report and what you're trying to do is excellent because um, the virtual learning is something we would like to see continue in some form to help us out with our, I don't know, our educational quiver of arrows that we can help teach the children. The only way it's going to be is if we make it good. I've had a lot of students that I see out in daily life, they, they just want to be in school and it, it's they struggle. So these numbers that we're, it's it's, these numbers aren't surprising, some of them, but at the same time, they're very concerning. I, for one, and I think all the board members are very glad to see they're concerning to you and you have a plan. And uh, we do have that money and we, we really want to look at it through Dr. Wilicki's eyes on how we best can use it. So thanks for a really good report. I, I think uh, I echo the board um, that you're putting the time in, first to get us on board in such a fast, quick amount of time, and then now you're analyzing it taking the time to analyze it, the hours you're putting in, I hope the public understands how long these hours have been for you. So thank you very much. And with that, we will transition to the middle school. So we have Mr. Lochner, Ms. McKessick, and Mr. Vizendi on the line this evening, and they're going to share an update in regards to the middle school goals. Sure, thank you, Dr. Walicki. Um, this is Jason Lochner, I'm the principal over at Herald, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk about our first goal. Um, Dr. Wolicki, yeah, thank you much. Um, and I should I should preface this by thanking um, Mr. Saracini because he gave a really, really thorough um, background about what the CDT does. And the CDT is is um, has has a integral uh, has a huge part with what we're doing with our goal. Um, so just to give you a brief background, so um, our focus is to increase student achievement by 5% at all tested subjects at all grade levels for the uh, upcoming 2021 PSSA. And um, in doing so, we're gonna meet or exceed the PBOS growth standard um, so that more students are gonna have, have the skills to be college and career ready by developing a data-based system. Um, we're going, we use 
CDTs to track the benchmarking for math and for science. And this year, new to us, we're going to be using the STAR 360 as our benchmark piece for ELA. We initially started the year also administering CDT and ELA. And, um, and through going through the curriculum cycle and, and just looking at a different um, some materials and things, they, they actually were feeling in that department that the STAR 360 um, gives them some better data points so that they can make, um, make their interventions. Um, so th that's where they are there with the STAR 360. Um, we admin as I said, we administered in September um, the benchmarks for all of the subjects. We re-administered the STAR in November for our ELA department. And then for all areas, we gave a winter benchmark that occurred uh, just in the past two to three weeks here in our, in our buildings. Um, based on that, we have a, a series of data points that are actually on the following slide that, um, that we can kind of get to in just a moment so you can peruse and see what how things are going. Um, but, but really what we wanted to focus on are also like the high school and the interventions that we're doing. Um, we've taken a real close look at our PSSA data, um, figured out what the proficiency level was for kids two years ago with their last administered PSSA. Um, we determined what was the what was the cohort group's proficiency level. We were able to compare that versus a state average, kind of gives us a, a, a starting point for how our kids are doing versus the state. We established the 5% increase in achievement. Um, so if you're looking at mine, for instance, this is Harold Middle School. And, and each one of us have our different data sets there here, and, and every data point is different for the building. Um, but the idea is the same. You can see where the kids were. You can see what our goal is. Um, you can see where they were versus the state average. And then we put our benchmark pieces in. So we have our fall, fall benchmark scores. We have our winter benchmark scores. When we benchmark again at the end of the year, which will be in May, we'll add our spring benchmark scores. And then assuming we still take PSSAs and PSSAs are, are on the docket for this year still, um, we'll be able to put our, our PSSA data point in and that will be able to sum things up for us um, to determine if we've achieved our goal or not. So really, um, I think what you wanna probably know from us is what are we doing uh, about it for the interventions? And we've, um, so in looking at that increase in achievement piece, we've asked all of our teachers to really pour through the benchmark data that they have available, whether it be the CDT or the STAR 360, and to identify um, strengths and weaknesses for all kids, but then also to have um, some really intensive targeted focuses for, kid, uh, for specific kids. And then teachers have a, a couple of different options that they can do their interventions. They, it might occur during the activity period, could, could occur during homeroom. I've got some teachers working with kids over lunchtime. They're doing some um, enrichment things, some reading groups, some book clubs. Um, hack of kids are hack of kids um, are invited into that as well. Um, sometimes, you know, when those kids don't come into school, they can still participate in these interventions on a virtual basis. So that's um that's really the system that we have in place. And um, you know, as I said, it, it, maybe at your leisure, you can you can toggle through all of those hyperlinks there, and you see um, all of our data for the three different buildings is um, is reported out for a year to this point. Okay, goal, goal two is uh, mine. Hi, Dave Zendi, uh, the <clears throat> principal at uh, Wendover. And again, I want to thank all the board members for listening to us tonight. I know this is a lot, so I appreciate your time. Um, that's my Google in the background. I'm sorry for that. Um, so the goal two was for influencing a culture of middle school community. So all students will have... Um, an opportunity to fully implement tier level one uh, PBIS and expiration present uh, preparations for tier two. Um, can you? I'm sorry. I'm going to go mute that real quick. I'm, I apologize. That's okay. Okay. I'm sorry about that. So for this goal, as you see here, the four steps, uh, for the most part, all three middle schools have uh, began the tier one intervention process. And uh, with tier one, we see uh, clear uh, expectations 
uh, and those expectations are taught uh, in regard to behavior. And we, we have uh, lessons that we have rolled out for our students, making it very clear, um, you know, how we want them to behave. And we pretty much cover all of the areas in the school so that students are well aware uh, of what we expect for their behavior. And that's for all the students in the school. So you see there's a mention of uh, tier two uh, interventions, uh, PBIS, Harold, is already at tier two. Wendover and Harold, or Wendover and Wend, um, West Hempfield will um, will apply for that. Will basically we're going to create some steps to get to tier two with the help of the IU. Uh, but right now, both Wendover and West Hempfield, along with Harold, are uh, enacting those tier one interventions that you see on the screen. The pictures that you're seeing in all of these slides that we made are of tier one interventions and mostly tier one interventions are those uh, rewards uh, for our students being uh, exemplary and showing the other students in the building that uh, when you follow the expectations and when you are meeting those expectations or exceeding those expectations that, uh, you know, something special is going to happen. And this uh, young lady that you see here uh, got to partake uh, in some hot cocoa. Uh, and that's just an example of how that might happen. All of those links under tier one are examples of things that we do at the three middle schools for tier one interventions. Tier two interventions will be eventually what we will get to. Uh, tier two is a little more targeted for students um, who may not be successful with tier one interventions. And we still might see some of those uh, behaviors that we uh, are trying to uh, avoid. And then uh, tier three uh, interventions is an even more uh, focused intervention and a smaller percentage of our students. And in tier three, you would see things like functional behavior uh, assessments, uh, wraparound supports, and those kinds of things. And those are more targeted to our uh, students uh, who are behavior, who have always been behavior issues and tier one and tier two uh, have not uh, caught. So that's, that's PBIS in a nutshell. You could click on any of those links that are under tier one and see some of the really cool things that we're doing in our schools, except that one. You can't click on that one. Try Wendover Way. I'm working two computers, so it takes me a little bit of time to get back and forth between the two. That's okay. So just an example here, These are this is Wendover Way. So Wendover does uh, tier one interventions. We have students who receive, I think you guys remember when I was uh, when I, the presentation that I did earlier in the school year, we talked about Wendover Way tickets. When students are seen meeting the expectations of the Wendover Way, they get tickets. All three middle schools have a different way of rewarding the students. This is ours. Uh, and you see students walked away with just small stuff, but middle school kids just eat this up. Uh, so they love stuff like this and just small rewards for them to meet those expectations. This was actually generated. This was uh, eighth grade, an eighth grade uh, art club at Wendover who created this. And this is our uh, pillars of uh, the Wendover way and the things that we look for. Uh, but if you come to Wendover, please feel free to stop by the conference room that's hanging in there. And uh, just a sort of, uh, uh, you know, visual representation of what the Wendover way uh, means to us. PBIS, I mean, you know, to, to wrap it up really is, is uh, extremely important, especially in a year like this, when uh, we know that our students are struggling, they're working hard, and we, we, we see ourselves getting further and further away from quote unquote normalcy. Uh, but this is, this is kind of the way that we, we kind of in inject a lot of that into a, a very abnormal year. I'm done. Sorry for the Google home going off there. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all well. Nice to see those of you who I can. This is Deanna McKessick, principal at West Hemfield Middle School. And for goal three, basically, this is the focus of our students who are in the middle. And as you know, the students in the middle, it's such a tremendously unique time for them because they are changing so much socially, emotionally, as well as physically. And what the Schools to Watch piece does is it helps us make sure that we're continuously focusing on those aspects of our changing middle school student. 
and it's broken down into four categories, academic excellence, the developmental progress that they're making, their social interactions, and basically the structures that we have in place in each of our schools to support our students. So as we went through this process, not last year, the year before, the Schools to Watch team came out to each building and they provided each of us with some strengths and then also considerations. So this is an ongoing process and even our strengths that we had in place previously, which were seemed so simple and we had mastered it, with all of the changes due to um, the current situation of hybrid schedule and hack of kids and trying to figure it all out, even our strengths are an ongoing process to continue to maintain that level of support for our students, as well as the considerations. So we meet with our grade level teams and also our specialty teachers to make sure we're continuously talking about these things um, to put our structures in place. Um, an example for one of West Hempfield's future considerations was to put a referral system in place to help support our students, which then in turn is part of our PBIS program. So that is, as Mr. Rezendi said, up and running and we're continuously doing those types of things. So just more of a challenge this year because things that were easy in the past have a new twist to them, but we're moving forward with it. And that concludes the part for our goal piece. But if you move on to the next slide, there are some other current statistics that we have that we also wanted to share with you regarding students and their performance um, with classes and failures. So if you wanna scroll clear to the bottom of that report, it's broken down as you can see again, HACA students, hybrid students, daily or edgenuity. And down at the bottom, it does a comparison between last year's students and the number of kids who were failing classes compared to this current school year. So there are definitely more students in the 2021 school year who are failing. In our sixth grade this year, we have a total of 39 students who are failing classes compared to 21 last year. In seventh grade, we have 68 students who are failing compared to 49 from last year. And in eighth grade, we have 55 eighth graders failing compared to 24 last year at this point. So with all of that in mind, they aren't necessarily failing the course for the semester or failing school because those numbers are just maybe one class or two classes. In order to fail for the year at this point, if we would look at it that way, a student would have to fail two major subjects or one major subject and two minor subjects or four minor subjects. So that information doesn't necessarily present that to you in that manner as to how many kids actually are failing. But for West Hempfield, I broke mine down a little bit further and it's not displayed there but I had 56 students who were failing at this point for semester. And when I looked at their attendance, 48 of those students of the 56 had some type of intervention for attendance, whether it was step one where the teacher's obviously reaching out and trying to get in touch as an attendance piece, although we had previously parent meetings or parent contacts, and our homeschool visitors involved, as Mr. Saracini said earlier, with our student attendance intervention conference, we have those as well. We also have truancy providers that are in place. And sometimes of the three, they're often full and limited. So we don't can't get our kids in there to have that additional support for our families at home. And then also I have kids who are also with um, complaints have been filed with the Children's Bureau. So of those, 48 kids, that's one of the major reasons is their attendance as to why they're failing. And I think that's a, a telling point. So what can we do to get our kids to attend school? The other piece with that is it wasn't just kids who maybe were in HACA or kids who were in AB or kids who were scheduled daily. It was all over the board. So that was another piece too. So it, it wasn't specific to a certain group of students. Um, and even still with those students, they changed a lot. So maybe they were on an A schedule one at one point and then they went to HACA and then they went back to A. So a lot of that back and forth has taken place as well. So when you're looking at that chart that had that current statistics on it, 
maybe one of our kids was in HACA for most of the year, but just went back to an A schedule and it's represented there as an A student when really maybe they were at HACA for a large majority of it. It was really hard to kind of convey all of that with that data in that manner, but there was a lot of movement up until this point. So I think that's another piece of information to know. So then, I'm sorry, Dr. Wilicki, back to then where we're going and what our plan is. Currently, our teachers do have hack a time where they focus on our kids outside of school and that's every other day. So one of our suggestions, so we have more remediation time with kids when we're here at school as well, is that we have, we move our hack a time to the after school hours. So that way when our kids are here, whether they're daily or on that AB schedule, our teachers can work with them in addition to bumping hack a time after school, which may be more convenient for hack of families if their parents are home later in the evening and they can just work out a different time to meet with those kids after hours. So that's one suggestion that we had moving forward to help support our kids. And then another option is on the last slide, and that is to possibly have um, tutoring in place. And we kind of, we asked our teachers what their, and it isn't even their interest, it's their availability, because so many of our teachers, of course, have young families as well and responsibilities after school. So how will that end up looking for our teachers to help support our kids tutoring? And they certainly want to help them and support them, but some of them may just not be able to based on their own family dynamic. So we have to figure out what is our interest of our teachers, um, availability of our teachers, and if we don't have them as an, a, a potential tutor, then maybe even contacting universities or hiring someone else, a math or ELA person to, con to help support our kids. We need to identify which students will be our focus, establish the hours, and then put transportation in place. Currently, we do have transportation once a week, but again, that's limiting to a Thursday evening, and maybe that's not conducive for all families to support them. So those are our ideas of how we can capture our kids in this current situation. And that concludes our report. Well, first say thank you to the middle school principals. It's obvious you have a strong pulse on the needs of the school and some great suggestions on how we need to move forward. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bompiani to take any questions from the school board. Sure, thank you, Dr. Wilkie, and, and thanks for the hard work. We appreciate it, and same things that I said to the High school principal is going to say to you as far as the um, work and the work you've done. Uh, moving forward, do we have any questions from board members here in the room for them? Anything for clarification? Any questions from board members online? Okay. Um, hearing none of that, I just had one question to all of you, and I, 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 I bring this up in the public. I, I don't, you know, full transparency. I, I just really... I'm concerned emotionally at these, for these kids anyway at this age, middle school age, children have so many dynamics as they grow and become young adults later in life. And I, I think when we took all the tours, we went to two of the three um, buildings last year and we talked, that was a, a big issue we talked about with the principals and the teachers. With the online, and not online, with the way it's been all year for these children, I mean, we're worried about all of our children. I mean, you hear it in the news every day, you know, we've got to get them back. Um, you know, the, the destructive, um, the depression, and I'll, I'll leave it at that, that has occurred. Do you see this with our schools? Do you see this uh, with the children uh, needing more help this year than other years? I mean, we're hearing educationally from both of uh, you groups of principals, but emotionally, I think a lot of us are worried about that. What are your thoughts with that? Have you seen that? I mean. Uh, Mr. Connor or, or uh, Kim, um, Tammy, somebody. Or maybe our principals would want to share because they're probably seeing more firsthand That's our fine. needs for students in this regard. Jason, I saw you shaking your head. Go ahead. I, I would say yes, um, but it's almost as if it, it's in a different format. There, you know, I, I guess their needs have manifested themselves in different ways. You know, normally we would have um, lots of kids coming to guidance counselor's office and there would be conflicts between other kids. But like, like going back to what Mr. Saracini said about the, um, the discipline, you know, oddly enough, we, we don't see the discipline. We're also not seeing those kinds of reports um, where kids are coming to guidance counselors. But then on, on a different turn, um, 
instead of them reaching out directly, we actually have a lot more parents reaching out to us directly, I think, than, than we would find things firsthand from the kids, um, would be my experience. I know that our SAP referrals for student assistance program are up this year. Um, and as Ms. Ms. McKessick said, I noticed I, I, attendance has definitely been a, a real challenge. Not that it's not always a challenge, but it's it's really been a challenge this year with with kids. So that's that's something that I I know I see. Well, and, and I appreciate that feedback. And I just to, to tag on to that, I, I would I mean I don't know what all this money that we we have from the grant is specifically being able to use. And I, I hear you want to use a lot to help these children educationally, which is wonderful. I'm all for that. Um, what about, are we allowed to use some of that money to hire psychologists to come in, to, to talk to our kids, to help through this? If one of our children becomes a statistic in this country, I think we're all going to be beating our head against the wall and saying, what the heck? Um, so, so the grant money is available through September 2023. So if staff are hired, then that becomes um, something we have to consider for the budget beyond September 2023. We can, okay, I got you. So it cannot be used, I mean, the purposes that are listed here, we would want to take a close look to see that they align. Okay. But then I just think sometimes staffing becomes a challenge to use. Grant money for staffing is usually avoided because it does then become a Well, I'm not a even talking expense. about maybe a, a long-term staffer, but even someone that come in to, to help us short-term. Right. So you know, that's like what, we would talk about tutoring and things. Right, and that's what the high school and the middle schools are looking at because then we're using some of our teachers and we're paying them for hours beyond the school day or we're looking the high school plan is to use some of our long-term subs in order to have them provide some additional content support during the day so certainly those are not in um in violation of our our agreements our contracts with our other employee groups gotcha okay, okay well okay. go ahead paul okay, I, yeah this is paul ward just a uh, a follow-up question so i guess I, you know, looking at the obviously the concerns of students who are struggling and, and failing classes and, and having attendance issues, it's a concern obviously this year, but, but looking at previous year's numbers too, I mean, I had concerns in the past, so I guess I'd look at, obviously we need to address the reasons why we're, there are additional issues because of probably because of COVID right now, but also try and do some things that will address the overall issue that we've dealt with in the past with underachieving students and student absentee issues and that sort of thing. I guess that's that's the biggest thing for me is it's not like this year is suddenly completely new having issues. So so we get to the core of it, hopefully. I think that's so true. And I think whenever the data was analyzed, even some of the, the principals had shared some comments in regards to thinking that this year was so much worse than past years. And as we started to look, no, these some of these problems existed in past years. We weren't just looking at it through that lens. So whenever I look at their goals, certainly that's, kind of around goal one, the achievement, but when you look at their goals two and three, that positive behavior intervention support is so important for kids to feel safe and secure, to find school to be a positive place. So I think there are lots of systems that they're addressing in goals two and three that are going to help. And even the high school's goal of looking at that, the mindset and opportunities for kids to feel that they can come to school. And you know, Mr. Saracini talked about selecting their courses. So I think there were some things that will allow us to make some changes that are not only going to impact this year, but future years as well. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, excellent reports. And, you know, um, sometimes you get lemons, you make lemonade. And, and I think what you're, to your point, Paul, you know, a lot of things are being brought out now because of COVID. Those are long-term mm -hmm. things we can work on, that including the virtual. But thank you all for the, the work you're doing. I mean, you, you put in a mon monumental amount of time and we do appreciate it and we don't mind spending the time listening to your reports thank you so much i want to say thank you as well and i have two more brief um, parts to my superintendent's report i realize it's a little long this evening but very important as you share dr bompiani the third part is just in regards to some recent information we received from the pennsylvania department of ed they have once again revised their protocols when we look at our, our hybrid plan i feel it really minimizes the potential for the spread of the coronavirus among our students. When we look at where we do have cases and, and parents report them and, and many times report where they believe the source to be found, we're and oftentimes finding that those cases are not here at school. And, and we're very fortunate for that because we do have the social distancing that's occurring um, in most areas. And I'll say most areas just because our school buses are the areas that are the biggest challenge. So whenever we do have a positive case, we are looking at bus footage to see if there are any potential close contacts. 
Um, the other, of course, is athletics, and that's just due to the nature of, um, of the sports. So when we do have a report of a positive case, we are following the what were referred to as recommendations, but of course with our attestation, we're now re requir required to follow. Um, something we were able to do was to minimize the number of days that we had to close our schools. We could close our school for a single day and um, reopen, reset our tracker, because we were able to have communication with families in which there may have been close contact. We were able to communicate needs in regards to quarantining. And, and I will share that the, the Department of Health has really provided um, little support to us as a school district um, because I believe they are so busy in, in other regards. And Dr. Maloney does just a wonderful job, and Mr. Rieger with our staff, in responding to inquiries whenever individuals report that there is a positive case or a potential um, exposure. So the recent guidance that we received is saying that if our district is served by the Department of Health, the Pennsylvania Department of Health, which we are, rather than a county or municipal health department, um, we are not permitted to reduce the number of days for school closure. So what this means is as we have future school closures, the minimum number of days that we can close will be three days, which is very unfortunate because it does put our children out of school um, for a number of days when the purpose is to be for cleaning schools and contact tracing. When cleaning schools occurs on a daily basis, our, our, our cleaning staff do a wonderful job because you never know when someone positive was in a space until four or five days later. So that space has to be cleaned daily. And second, when there is close contact, which here at school is minimal, there are so many times we get reports of someone who was positive and we, we look at the classroom and those seats are six feet apart. Many times, if the child is transported to school, there are no close contacts. So there is no contact tracing that needs to occur. But because we cannot um, get permission from the Department of Health to reopen any sooner, we are obligated to have the three days of school closure. So I just wanted to share that because I think to the community that's something as we move forward, there will be questions as to why are we closing for three days when really we know it's, it's, it's not quite necessary. Um, unless there would be a large outbreak, but I, again, believe with our hybrid plan, that's not going to happen. So I have one final item, which is in regards to um, our county data, which, um, if you're following, is looking better each week. We're getting closer to being considered moderate. Not yet. There are two criteria, and right now we have met one of those criteria as a county, and so we're still considered um, in that highest level. However, we are moving closer. As we are moving in that direction, questions are starting to come forward as to when can we look at our middle schools and moving forward with our plan where we bring more students back into the building, but again, keeping that six feet. So one of the things that we, we have to look at in order for that to occur is our staffing and our classroom supervisors. We do not yet have the number of necessary classroom supervisors, so that's, that is something we're going to continue to promote um, if we have um, any community members who are interested in being employed as a classroom supervisor, please reach out to uh, Mr. Rieger in our HR office. We're also going to be looking at that county spread and saying it would be preferable if we're in the moderate phase for two consecutive weeks and we have the staffing that is necessary for our classroom supervisors that we then move to that, to that um, next phase of our plan. We would then monitor just to be sure that it's not now having us close our schools more frequently, which unfortunately now would be for a minimum of three days. So that is our goal. We're continuing to work on those um, positions and getting those classroom supervisors. ESS is who we contract with, um, is working hard to, to find individuals for those positions, and then also watching that county um, community spread so that we can hopefully get back into the moderate level and someday the low level. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing that I did not have on the agenda, um, and this is in regards to flexible instructional days. Today we did close school and did not have a flexible instructional day because we did not distribute the devices on Friday. And it's really a challenge, not only in the time it takes to distribute the devices, but in getting the devices returned to school and because they're, they're so needed for the daily instruction that we um, are hesitant to distribute them. But we did get news today that um, our order is moving forward with our shipment. I'm going to ask David if you would step up to a microphone and just give us an update in regards to our devices, which I believe this order is still going back to July. Yes. 
Go check uh, with technology. Uh, yes, I did speak to our representative from YNS Technologies today. Um, he did confirm with me that our shipment of 500 100E model Chromebooks arrived in their warehouse in Colorado, and he's going to get tracking to me in the next day or so, and they should be on our way to us fairly soon. Um, so we'll have those at our disposal to, to use when needed. Uh, as far as our order for the 300Es, he does not have an update on those. Um, Lenovo is prioritizing the uh, building of the 100E models, so he does not, he can't guarantee um, that we'll get the 300Es, but he told me by the end of the month maybe they'll be shipping out, um, but he can't guarantee that, so that's what I have. So once those devices are in sight, then that's something our department, our IT department will need to get them yep. set as, up as and soon distributed. As we, get them, uh, we will enroll them, uh, asset tag them, get them in our system, um, and we'll get those ready to distribute to uh, whoever uh, needs to get them. Thank you, David. That concludes my long report this evening. Um, next week we'll have report. the elementary principal. Next week, uh, two weeks, we'll have the elementary principals give an update in regards to their progress. Long or not, it was a good report. I did have a question. In the future, I think some of us were hoping with snow days and things like that, we would be able to go virtual. So next year, would we have the computers? Would we be able to do it? Or yes, we should have the computers for next year. If not for the end of this year, the, the computers that David was referring to were actually our order for next year's ninth graders. So we may need to look at using some of our grant funding to purchase additional computers to replace those for the ninth graders for next year to use the computers that are arriving here shortly for our current elementary students. Okay. So we are looking at that. Yeah, the report was really good. And I, I don't know how many people are listening from the public. And I, I don't usually go on a, any type of tirade. And I'm not going to go on a tirade. But I'm going to show you or tell you about my, my big disgust with the Department of Ed and also with the Department of Health. They told us in November or whatever when they put these new restrictions down, they wanted to leave it up to school districts. You know your school district, you know your numbers, you know you work within our numbers and we're going to work together. Dr. Willicke just said that they, the way they, we do the contact tracing, and my voice is quivering because I am upset about this. The way we do our contact tracing, the, the fantastic work our employees do, keeping this sanitary, keeping our children safe. We know our children better. We know our school district better. We know our schools better. And because the county doesn't have their own health department or own restrictions, we have to go by their restrictions, which make, means you're out of school two extra days when you don't need to be. The reason I'm bringing this up and, and identifying it this way, this isn't political at all. Call everybody you know in the state, everybody and anybody, if you're listening, call them and start telling them how ridiculous this is getting to be. Our children are being held hostage. This is disgusting. And we don't, our hands are tied to even help our own children. So please, people out there, help us. If other board members are upset with me and want to rebuke me, go right ahead right now. If you agree with me, then you agree with me. So if I don't hear anything, we'll move on. But thank you for a great report. It was, it was fantastic and, um, and very informative, too. The hearing of citizens on agenda items, we do have two agenda items with the personnel and the um, supplementals, which we're going to be asking for a suspension of the rules. Pam, do we have anybody from uh, the public that wants to speak toward those two things? I didn't receive any of this for this meeting at all. None at all. Okay. Thank you very much. Not at all. We'll move on to student representatives. Uh, Gianna, you want to give us your report? Uh, we do not have any report tonight. Okay. And we'll move on. Thanks for attending, though. I appreciate it. Solicitor's report. Michael? No report at this time. Thank you. And board secretary's report, um, next month we're going to be asking for the pre-agenda meeting and for the regular meeting of January minutes to be um, um, approved. And right. building, okay. Anything else, Pam? Yep. Nothing else. Thank okay. you. And buildings and grounds, uh, Vince, anything? going to get, get ready for a lot of work. We have our, um, you want to touch on that? We do. So we're scheduled for Monday. It will be an executive session because it is um, d developing contracts for a feasibility study. So the school board will be hearing presentations from seven applicants, um, a number next Monday, and others two weeks, well, three weeks from today. Um, we'll be um, hearing presentations from the remaining. So we are moving forward with selecting a company for our feasibility study. Um, and we're looking forward to that process. Okay, thank you. And um, educational programs, uh, Jeannie, do you have anything? There's nothing. I do not. Sorry, I had to get unmuted. 
That's I okay. Anything, anything right to now. add, Tammy? There's not. February is typically one of our slower months, just in sharing and comparing it to last year. So there, there are some items that do not have much. Okay. And we'll move on to personnel committee. Diane, you're going to have to ask for suspension. I ask for a suspension of rules, please. Second. Seconded by Scott. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposition on suspending the rules? Hearing none, the motion carries. Diane? Okay, I move that we approve P057-21 through P, let me get there, sorry, P06521. And they do include uh, a resignation, a hiring of a part-time building aid at West Hemfield, a... Um, an administrative assistant for elementary, secondary, and central administration, intermittent leave, a leave of absence, uh, a couple leave of absence, and also the approval to reassign Ashley Testa to the high school for an interim assistant principal at the high school, and um, substitute and a special, uh, special sick leave. Okay, do we have a second? Second, uh, second, second. Paul? Paul Ward second. Any questions or discussions from board members? Anybody online, any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> any opposition? That motion carries. Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. Anything else, uh, Bob or Tammy, for personnel? For uh, next? No, thank you. We'll have more for next, Most likely. next meeting, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, athletics, uh, Paul Ward. Um, sorry, there's nothing to report this evening. Okay, thank you. And Brandon, anything? No, not at this time. Again, our next meeting, um, we're, we're waiting on a, a date from the PIAA with their parameters on spring sports. Um, we know that that date will be March 8th, that they will begin, but uh, similar to the, the fall and the winter, uh, they'll be providing their COVID protocols. As soon as we have those then, and, and we know what that date is, then we'll certainly be looking to schedule a meeting and, and outline a number of our spring items. Okay, thank you. Uh, on a side note, um, I will tell you, Brandon, I was really impressed with how you were handling the crowd and everything going on at the basketball game on Friday. It was senior night, and it was a nice night. and. Um, Scott, you represented the board well, and um, I appreciate it because I could see how hard the work was. It was just so nice to see the grandparents there and other people there. Um, it was a nice crowd, and we had a victory too, correct? Yeah, that's very, very nice. Okay, and um, we'll move on then to supplementals. Mike? Yes, we have uh, S. You want to suspend? You have to suspend the rules. A motion to suspend. Second. Second by Diane. <laughs> Motion by Mike, seconded by Diane. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Is there any opposition to suspension of the rules? Hearing none, all those in I'm sorry. Motion carries. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I move that we <clears throat> approve S006-21, uh, the resignation of Department Chair of Social Studies, effective January 18th. And there are several in S002. 7-21 for um, spring musical and, a, and a, several um, assistant coach supplementals. And I also move S008-21 that the next two individuals as volunteers in the sport of the 2021 school year, 2020 and 2021 school year uh, for an ice hockey and indoor track coach. Do I have a second to the motion? Second. Scott. Seconded by Scott. Motion by Mike, second by Scott. Any discussion or questions from the uh, board? Hearing nothing, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? Those motions carry. Thanks, Mike. Anything else with supplemental? No. Okay. And we'll move on to Finance Committee. Sonia? Yes, next week I'll be asking for the bills as we do. Um, dollar amounts will be filled in, so those won't be put on the consent agenda as normal. 
and the activity statement will be there for the approval. Okay. Nothing else. Thanks, Sonia. And um, Wayne, we're good? Anything else? Nothing else. Okay. And thank you very much. We'll move on to policy committee. Jeannie? Hi. Next week, we will be asked to approve several fundraisers. Um, and they're all listed there. And one is for the high school track and field parent association. One is for Wendover Pie. One is for West Point PTS and another is for West Point PTS. And we'll be asked to vote on those in two weeks, excuse me. Okay. Thank you. And we'll move on to technology. Scott, anything? I have nothing. I didn't know if Jeannie had anything to add because I wasn't able to attend the last meeting. I do not have anything to add. I because most of what was discussed was put into the executive report that we got. And um, we're, we were updated on that. So I don't have anything to add to that. But okay. thank you for asking, Scott. Nothing else from administration, correct? Okay, thanks, Scott. And we'll move on to Central Career, Westmoreland Career and Technology Center. Uh, I have nothing to add, but we are having a meeting this Thursday. Hmm? I've heard the food there is very, very good. I, I don't know what you're talking there. about. You don't know what you're talking about. That's why we have to fight you to try and get you not to be on it. Um, <laughs> I found that afterwards. You know, um, for, for years, since the early 2000s, that's what everybody has been on that, say, bragging about those children and how they do the preparation for that. I get there late. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, Scott? That's it. I'll have a, I'll have a report um, next time. All right, thank you. And uh, Westmoreland Intermediate Unit, Jennifer? She heard you. Jennifer, Westmoreland um, Intermediate Unit report? Jennifer, can you speak a little louder? It didn't, just didn't come through. Now you're muted. It's on mute. I'm not hearing her. I can see that you're speaking, but I can't hear what you're saying. And it your mic muted. might be cut down. Yeah. Your volume might be cut down. Do you have a report? Anything to share? No, she's shaking yeah, I'm assuming. Okay, okay, gotcha. And um, the meeting dates off here too. It'll be the end of February, correct? Well, she just had a meeting, so we kept that date, thinking maybe she'd have something. Okay, to share well, whatever report. Date. If there's one from that meeting, you can give it next meeting, Jennifer. And then under school board report, we'll be asking to reappoint Jennifer to serve on the. Um, or to appoint Jennifer to serve on the library board, and we, we do thank her for this because it's another uh, timing issue, and she's um, happily agreed to do that. All these reports of standing committees we'll do at the next meeting, right, Tammy? Yes. All the ones down low. Sure. Okay, and so no more hearing of citizens, you said. You didn't have any, right, Pam? Correct. Okay. So um, anything else for the good of the board? If nothing else, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Motion by Scott, seconded by Paul. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition?